next ice age, given the current human influence on the entire Earth system. We're really in an non-analog state for the Earth system, which actually places, I would argue, the really big, big quest for global sustainability science, illustrated here by a fantastic graph, unpublished yet by Martin Schaeffer and Will Stefan et al. that we're working on right now, that we know fairly well the limit cycles of the Earth system. We have the 100,000 Milankovic kind of periodicity on ice ages, and that we now have faced a point where we're exiting that interglacial sliver of Garden of Eden that we've had since the last 12,000 years, and that the big quest for global sustainable development is to be able to stay within a governed Earth manageable interglacial state and avoiding crossing thresholds that could irreversibly flip feedbacks and take us into a hothouse state that could no longer support neither poverty alleviation nor human well-being and certainly not prosperity for a world of 7.6 moving to 9.5 billion co-citizens on Earth. And that this is backed up, as we all know here, of course, by an equation that I would argue kind of manifests the great advancements of Earth system science over the last 30 years. The empirical evidence that we are in the new geological epoch, the Anthropocene. The empirical evidence that the interglacial Holocene state is and was a prerequisite for civilizational development as we know it. And that Earth tipping points are part of normality. That long periods of Earth resilience can suddenly be just opposed from crossing tipping points and irreversibly moving into completely new states that can undermine the ability for sustainable development. Which means that we now should seriously consider moving away from the 1992 modern definition of sustainable development in terms of intergenerational responsibility for reducing environmental impacts to actually having it as a defined as it seriously should be in the Anthropocene. It is about world development on a stable, and resilient Earth system. But this has an even deeper implication, I would argue. It has a kind of a philosophical deep point in why it's so critical right now with the sustainable development goals, which comes as follows. We have the empirical evidence now, I would argue, even you know, unequivocally on the table that it's the last 50 years that we have destabilized the conditions for human civilizations over the past 10,000 years. But we have equal increasing amount of evidence to suggest that it is what we do over the next 50 years that will be determining the outcome for humanity over the coming 10,000 years. And I'm kind of looking a bit in the audience here, and perhaps I'm a bit grayer than you are, but I've been around for the last 50 years, so I'm a victim. I'll hand up my hand. I've been part of taking us into this Anthropocene risk zone, and I hope to be here for better parts, at least, of the coming 50 years. So this is the time, this is us, this is the generation that has the possibility and responsibility now to guide the transformation towards a sustainable development future that combines equity and justice for nine and a half billion people on a stable and resilient Earth system. And of course, we've seen the hockey stick patterns that lays behind this evidence, we know it, but just a reminder that this is of course a fundamental piece of research showing that we've entered the Anthropocene, that all the curves look like this, that we entered the Anthropocene in the mid-1950s, we're three and a half billion people, that's when we put in the high gear of the industrial metabolism that has taken us to the point where we no longer have any excuse for combining world and earth in sustainable development. But I would argue that the key finding is, is that it's not until 1990 that we enter the saturation point that between the entering of the Great Acceleration and 1990, we still operate unsustainably with a world economic model that kind of moves along a GDP growth pattern on linear production systems, where we largely actually can subsidize human well-being by exploiting oceans, forests, loading atmosphere with greenhouse gases. But the Earth system is so resilient it can absorb and dampen and maintain negative feedbacks. It's in 1990 the cod fisheries collapse out of Newfoundland. It's in 1990 Steve Carpenter really maps out the flips in lake systems in the US, giving him the Stockholm Water Prize just a few years back. It's in 1990 the Baltic Sea flips from its oxygen rich to its anoxic state that we currently have as an algal bloom frequent state in the northern parts of the hemisphere. It's in 1990 that we passed through the 50 ppm in carbon dioxide equivalents in the atmosphere. It's in 1990 we start seeing the first evidence of accelerated melt in the Arctic Sea. 
It seems like the 1990 is the point where we start, as Will Steffen points out, hitting the hardwired biophysical ceiling of the processes that regulate the Earth system. It's in 1990, as Professor John Schellenhuber often points out, we reached the saturation point. And it's therefore just in the last 25 years, actually exactly the time of existence of the Potsdam Institute, that we have reached the point where we no longer can operate along this planet-subsidized human well-being and gives us development where in fact we now need to transition into a completely new logic where everything we do, prosperity, development, poverty alleviation, occurs within Earth's safe operating space. It gives this message from science, which is quite simple, that up until 1990 we are still this relatively small world on a big planet. We can actually kind of deliver on human well-being, try to reduce environmental impacts as much as we can, but still not be sustainable. On the aggregate, we still have rebound effects taking us towards unsustainability, and there are no invoices sent back from the Earth system into societies. But it's since 1990 onwards that we are the relatively big world on a small planet. We have reached a completely new position. And we have the evidence, and the evidence comes largely from this room again. I think the synthesis on uh, Earth system tipping points that we are at risk of triggering if we push the system beyond the saturation point is a phenomenal piece of work into the sustainable development agenda. Just as a reminder that it's not only ice sheets, it is uh, big biomes, it is the monsoon uh, rain system, it is big, big system that regulates the Earth system stability but also provides our ability to really, really build sustainable development. The following graph, and I know many of you need to have the uh, the kind of acknowledgement for this one. I would argue that every climate negotiator, every sustainable development policymaker should have the following graph in his or her hand because I think it's a phenomenal piece of information why the precautionary principle must be applied. The reminder that the last 20,000 years we exit the last ice age, we enter this Garden of Eden period, the Holocene of the last 12,000 years. You see average temperature on Earth on the y-axis, the plus minus one degree Celsius, you know, really... Garden of Eden, narrow, narrow stability zone we were in. The reminder that the Paris range of staying below two is actually outside of the Holocene equilibrium. So saying that we are actually not in a return point. We are even at best at a manageable interglacial state. And loading on that, the evidence we have today on the risk of pushing systems that regulate the ability for sustainable development across tipping points. And as you see, and this reminder I think one always needs, that coral reefs lies within Paris. And they're all dipping into Paris here on the left-hand side, Alpine glaciers, Arctic sea ice, even Greenland. And Greenland is, is important here because not only of the seven-meter sea level rise risk, but the, but the recognition that we might be pushing the on button much, much earlier than the impact hits on sustainable development, which raises the question of morality. What is our moral time zone of obligation? I would argue that that should certainly be beyond 100 years and certainly beyond 300 years. Now, if we take just these... Uh, kind of hotspot systems, the number one kind of cannery in the gold mine is clearly the Arctic. And just before President Barack Obama left the White House, he engaged tremendously, as you may know, in the Arctic. He gathered science and the Glaciers Initiative in Alaska, and then he asked science to prepare this report that we were working, many of us, together on, showing the evidence that two degrees Celsius warming in the world means five degrees Celsius in the Arctic, that the amplifying effect actually leads to one of the biomes that regulates the stability on Earth into a, you could call it, disaster zone. The other cannery in the gold mine is clearly coral reefs in the world. And I think the following piece of, of evidence is, is nothing less than shocking, actually. 1998, you recall the El Nino event that hit most of the coral reef systems in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific and Caribbean across tipping points. But the Great Barrier Reef was resilient enough to withstand that bleaching event. Then we get an amplified El Nino event in 2015-2016 with almost 80% bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef. Now that, in a resilient system, can still rise after that shock. But in 2017, this year, another bleaching event hit the Great Barrier Reef, and the latest documentation and observations from Terry Hughes and colleagues at the James Cook University shows that 50%, 5-0% of the Great Barrier Reef has crossed an irreversible tipping point and is dead. So we've lost half of the Great Barrier Reef. I think this is a signal 
of the seriousness in terms of sustainable development, no more than 250 million people have the livelihoods directly coupled to the coastal zone sources of livelihoods originating from coral reefs, from fisheries to tourism. We have um, all the evidence on another biome, which is in the rainforest, showing the risk of tipping point to savanization, the work, um, the phenomenal work of Nicholas Bores and others on, on tipping point induced by monsoon system interactions, the moisture feedback interaction that we see in, in tipping points in Amazon, and the latest paper from Woods Hole showing that rainforest systems in the world have now kind of flipped over, it appears, from being a net source to a net sink. No, the other way around net sink to net source, and that this is one of these very, very serious signals of a system that no longer is obviously stable enough to support sustainable development. So it's not a surprise that the equation was turned in 2009 from, you know, Anthropocene, Holocene tipping points into a world on a stable and resilient Earth system. It was actually turned logically into the next step in Earth system science, trying to say quantitative safe boundaries within which we can have a manageable interglacial state of the Earth system. That is what the planetary boundary framework is. It tries to define the Earth system processes that regulate the Earth system and define for sustainable development the space within which we can prosper. And you've probably seen the 2009 launch of this, the 2015 update, which is a kind of a, a guide for sustainable development, which has increasingly been integrated in both business and policy, and has inspired also the sustainable development goals in its framing on social, economic, and sustainable development in the Earth system. Business is picking this up at a wide scale, as you may be aware. The World Business Council has transformed the planetary boundaries into their action 2020, putting sustainability within their business models, not as a corporate social responsibility. The B team and others doing the same. A number of countries are also trying to downscale planetary boundaries into their kind of guiding development in the future. We have a number of organizations doing similarly from the UN to the OECD. And we're working right now with the Global Environment Facility to redefine the global commons in the Anthropocene recognizing that there are no such thing as externalities that are not integral to economy and sustainable development. We see a number of world transformations occurring in this context. In this report to the Global Environment Facility, we identify the urgent need to transform the world energy system, decarbonize the energy system, transformation towards sustainable cities, transforming towards healthy and sustainable food systems, and a transformation to a circle economy as the four fast-track pathways for sustainable development in the future. And in closing, I just want to give you a, an example of how this translates to sustainable development. So if we are at this state, and we need to stay within a global carbon budget of a safe operating space for a stable Earth system, it translates, interestingly, into a Moore's Law-inspired innovation and transformation pathway. We published this recently with colleagues at PIC uh, in science on the global carbon law, which goes very quickly as follows. When you translate Paris, into what has to happen. It has, as we all know, this decarbonization pathway of turning, bending the curve of emissions no later than 2020 for carbon dioxide, fossil fuel burning in the gray zone here, down to roughly a fossil fuel free world economy 2050, 2060. But that is not enough, as we know. It requires this transition from the world food system in brown from a carbon source to a carbon sink, an agricultural revolution. But not even that is enough. We have to, whether we like it or not, consider scaling carbon capture and storage and BECs at a very large scale. And not even that is enough. We need to maintain the natural carbon sinks in the biosphere on land and ocean. And even if we do all this, even if we are at this energy revolution, the food revolution, the CCS scaling and an earth resilience revolution, I would argue, we have a 75% chance of reaching one and a half degrees Celsius and staying below two. So this is why we have proposed that this translates into a carbon law of halving emissions every decade. And if we can half emissions every decade, we follow a Paris path on the decarbonization pathway, which directly gives you a connection between earth system science and sustainable development, which argues very strongly for the need of stronger planetary stewardship. That is no longer acceptable that nations individually decide, look here, we're now going to go egoistic a few years because we don't have the ability to kind of contribute towards collective progress and that that is not the state we can 
consider acceptable in the Anthropocene. That we need to simply abandon this old definition of sustainable development in its three pillars. And I'm a great, you know, one of my biggest heroes is Gruhal in Brundtland, who led the whole Rio Brundtland Commission. But it was set up as the human, ecological, and natural dimensions of sustainable development. And we simply must admit, it, it failed. It became a Mickey Mouse economy overall. The economy grew, yes, thank you, at the expense of human capital and natural capital. And that this must now be really forcefully integrated into the sustainable development goals. The 17 goals, the first time ever humanity has a roadmap for aspirational socioeconomic goals within planetary boundaries of freshwater, climate, biodiversity, and oceans. And we have now gathered the scientific community, and many of you are involved in this, in the world in 2050, which is an effort of getting the integrated assessment modeling community, analysts from local to global scale, to really explore transformation pathways of how do we attain the sustainable development goals by 2030, but then continue these pathways until 2050 within planetary boundaries in a way that achieves the social goals while staying on a stable and resilient Earth system. It translates scientifically, actually, that the 17 goals cannot be, as they often are, seen as a Swedish smurgos board, where you kind of pick your goodies and just do what you feel uh, able to do. It must actually be translated into a wedding cake where four of the boundaries, four of the sustainable development goals, are non-negotiable. They're the platform within which we can achieve the social and economic goals. So as a closing slide, just to give you another little equation then for sustainable development in a world of turbulence and in a world of the Anthropocene, maybe simply that we need to shift over Mickey Mouse towards a wedding cake can give us a world prosperity of sustainable development within a resilient and stable Earth system. And this is a completely new agenda, and luckily we're starting to see the first elements of recognition in the political leadership in the world through the sustainable development goals. The key challenge is keep them together and start concretizing them at the local scale. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we have time for one or two questions. So please, hands up, I try to see you. Okay, there's just one hand. I guess you can see it. I'd like to ask you a very personal question because you said you've been around for 50 years. I've been around for a few years less and I'm actually born in, uh, in the midst of the 70s and that happens to be the time when the Club of Rome and Meadows first talked about limits of growth. Just a very personal question. Why should I be... Uh, what, what is different now? Because um, I've heard throughout my life lists of aspirations of goals, MDGs and, and 1992 as a big step forward and so on, but still a lot of things are still going wrong. What's different now? What, what, what should give me hope that this is different? Yeah, thanks. I, I love this question because those are the kind of five slides I deleted um, in the end because of the short timeline here. So to begin with, what is different is, of course, the fact that we're the first generation to sit on the evidence that we've reached this saturation point. When Rachel Carson wrote her Silent Spring in 1962, or when the Limits to Growth came out in 1972, shot down, by the way, as we all know, by policy and business around the world, they were just at the beginning of these exponential curves of human pressure. I mean, it was really even uncertain where the curves would be heading. It could actually be a linear projection. So, I would argue that one thing that is different is, is the responsibility. But the most important difference, the most important difference is that we're seeing a very significant, just over the last five, six years, I would argue, tipping point where sustainability has moved from being, you know, the big sacrifice, the big uh, climate negotiating war between the trench war of, of developing versus developed countries over compensation and responsibility of historic risk, looking at climate, for example, as an environmental risk and an environmental issue, to now having tipped over where sustainability increasingly is seen as an opportunity space, as a pathway to more competitive and more attractive and more advanced solutions. If I had time here, I would have shown you that we're actually following the global carbon law. We're seeing the pace that uh, 
Professor Klinsing last night showed us of the renewable energy, which has gone from 0.8% to 2.8% on global energy provision in the world, even though these numbers are very small, they follow a doubling every fifth year. Every fifth year, renewable energy in the world is doubling. And if you project that pace into the future, it follows the global carbon law. And it actually means that just business as usual takes us to a world fossil fuel-free economy by 2045. I mean, if we, would, if we would be able to keep the exponential pace into the future. So I think there's a lot of hope in terms of the tipping point and the recognition that sustainability is, is the new entry point. We, I mean, Jeffrey Sachs points out, and I support him, we're now in the era of sustainable development. I think that is a significant difference compared to just 30 years back when everything we were talking about the environment was still an environmental issue. And the question was, how much are we willing to sacrifice to deal with the problem? Now it's rather a, a different story. It's almost like a race. Who will be most successful in terms of should we or should we not go deep into sustainability? This is a very optimistic assessment, though, because we see how things go up and down in the world, but I think that is a change. So this is the time. This is us. This is the generation that has the possibility and responsibility now to guide the transformation towards a sustainable development future that combines equity and justice for 9.5 billion people on a stable and resilient Earth system. And of course, we've seen the hockey stick patterns that lays behind this evidence, we know it. But just a reminder that this is, of course, a fundamental piece of research showing that we've entered the Anthropocene, that all the curves look like this, that we entered the Anthropocene in the mid-1950s, we're three and a half billion people, that's when we put in the high gear of the industrial metabolism that has taken us to the point where we no longer have any excuse for combining world and earth in sustainable development, but it's that the interglacial Holocene state is and was a prerequisite for civilizational development as we know it, and that earth tipping points are part of normality, that long periods of earth resilience can suddenly be just opposed from crossing tipping points and irreversibly moving into completely new states that can undermine the ability for sustainable development, which means that we now should seriously consider moving away from the 1992 modern definition of sustainable development in terms of intergenerational responsibility for reducing environmental impacts to actually having it as a defined as it seriously should be in the Anthropocene. It is about world development on a stable and resilient Earth system. But this has an even deeper implication, I would argue. It has a kind of a philosophical deep point in why it's so critical right now with the sustainable development goals which comes as follows. We have the empirical evidence now, I would argue, even you know, unequivocally on the table that it's the last 50 years that we have destabilized the conditions for human civilizations over the past 10,000 years. But we have equal increasing amount of evidence to suggest that it is what we do over the next 50 years that will be determining the outcome for humanity over the coming 10,000 years. And I'm kind of looking a bit in the audience here, and perhaps I'm a bit grayer than you are, but I've been around for the last 50 years. So I'm a victim. I'll hand up my hand. I've been part of taking us into this Anthropocene risk zone. And I hope to be here for better parts, at least, of the coming 50 years. ice age given the current human influence on the entire earth system. We're really in an non-analog state for the earth system, which actually places, I would argue, the really big, big quest for global sustainability science, illustrated here by a fantastic graph unpublished yet by Martin Schaeffer and Will Stefan et al. that we're working on right now, that we know fairly well the limit cycles of the Earth system. We have the 100,000 Milankovic kind of periodicity on ice ages, and that we now have faced a point where we're exiting that interglacial sliver of Garden of Eden that we've had since the last 12,000 years, and that the big quest for global sustainable development is to be able to stay within a governed Earth manageable interglacial state and avoiding crossing thresholds that could irreversibly flip feedbacks and take us into a hothouse state that could no longer support neither poverty alleviation, 
nor human well-being, and certainly not prosperity for a world of 7.6 moving to 9.5 billion co-citizens on Earth. And that this is backed up, as we all know here, of course, by an equation that I would argue kind of manifests the great advancements of Earth system science over the last 30 years. The empirical evidence that we are in the new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, the empirical evidence